Um, I'm Steve Freeman. I kind of have two jobs. One, one is at what's now Springer Nature, which is a scientific publisher. Uh, we have a group in London. And then the other one is uh, it's actually a Swiss consultancy called Zulka, uh, which has a, um, I work for the London office part-time. Uh, and we're both recruiting. <laughs> so <laughs> funny that. Who would have thought? Um, so this is, this is based on a, a sort of experience I had with some of my colleagues. And it's a little rant for those of us who've been around more than a little bit longer, uh, about how working at the Unix command line is a resource that many people seem to have forgotten. And this is about the Unix command line, but the principles are more general, and it a, there's a DOS shell and a command shell and all that, all that kind of stuff. So just if you, for those of you who don't work in this world, um, if you just sort of think of the principles. Um, but I th it, seem, it strikes me we've become too comfortable in our full screen IDEs. Um, one thing that drives me nuts is when you get a big monitor, you know, spent all this money on big pixels, and then you fill it with an IDE, most of which is white space. And you know, for those of us who came up, you know, from 80 by 20 characters all the way up, this just seems a terrible waste. Um, it's possible that almost all of this talk will be obvious and screamingly obvious to to some people in the room. So I suggest you go out and get another coffee if if that's yes, yeah, he's already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, um, but otherwise, if you also have equivalent experiences to contribute, feel free to, feel free to interrupt. So we were working on a little project to do some text analysis. And this is the basic algorithm, is to extract a lot of content and stick it in Elasticsearch. As far as I can tell, text analysis is mostly about sticking it in an Elasticsearch and fiddling with, the, fiddling with the index until something happens. In practice, this was slightly more complicated because of the API we had to the, the content source. Um, so we have journals, journals have articles, and you know, we have lots of journals, but we don't want all of them. So first part, get, get the list of all the journals, get the ones that are active, because not all of them are active. For all the active journals, get a list of the IDs of all the articles. And then for each artic article, um, Identifier, go and get the contents of the article. So there's a sort of protocol going on. And then when you've got gathered all this data, construct an elastic index and upload it. Um, but there are complexities with this. So for example, we wanted the last 300 articles for each journal, but the API was paged at 50 articles at a time. So we had to do a bit of looping around that. Um, and then there are things like you're dealing with real data. So there are surprising glitches in the data. Um, there's one article we have, one paper we have, where the title is a GIF, or it is, is an image. Bec it's a, apparently it's a math paper of some sort. So, you know, text analyze, text analyze that. And then you get the usual failures and timeouts and retries and all, all the sort of generic stuff. And so we wanted an environment where we could um, try things out and maybe retry and all that kind of stuff um, because we were exploring the space which is a very common, common sort of thing to do. Um, so the usual response for a lot of, in fact, the usual response for this is, oh, good, I can install distributed framework X, like Spark or something, and then we can do it on, you know, we can get some Amazon, uh, or we can get some uh, instances up and, uh, you know, and distribute, or I'm going to be doing MapReduce, it'd be great. And then I thought, so well, hang on a minute. Um, all the data we've got would fit very nicely on this single multi-core box, which is, uh, I think, eight cores and lots and lots of memory. Um, the real, real bottleneck is not the distribution, but just getting the content out of, out, of, uh, out of our service. I really don't want to spend the rest of my life, the rest of the day, watching Mav Maven download the internet again, um, or trying to understand the framework, some large framework. Um, because although the examples, the one-line examples, are always easy, uh, when you actually try and do something useful, it always finds there's a, there's a learning hole that you disappear into for a while while you're trying to get it to work. So I didn't want to go that way. The other thing is, motivation for this, is that in our group, we've been doing a lot of stuff with microservices recently. Um, we've been sort of moving in that direction. And I've been experimenting with what happens if we actually believe in microservices and we actually make them small. Um, and it turns out that if you take this seriously, you need surprisingly little infrastructure just to render some stuff over an HTTP connection. Um, 
and I've discovered that. Um, sorry, I'm just getting to the bit. I've discovered that you know one of the problems you know, you know, we all have with with large frameworks and stuff is is the dependency hell. You know, and the multiple versions of low-level libraries and all that kind of stuff, and it all just sort of sticks together and gets painful. And I've discovered one way to deal with that is not to have any dependencies um, by being absolutely minimal, and in some cases it works really well. The other, so that's what I wanted to experiment with. The other part is it's easy to forget just how powerful these machines are um, and just how much data we can process on one box. In this case, once we got going, we, we had the whole elastic in, you know, search, uh, full text indexing stuff going on one of the calls. We never noticed. You know, there was no problem um, with no observable impact. I mean, one, of, one of the moments in my life, if, if you... You know the Raspberry Pi, little credit card size computer? That's an order of magnitude bigger in all dimensions than the machine I did my PhD on. Um, I remember when I first saw a machine with 96 meg of RAM and I thought that was just stupid. Why would you want 96 meg of RAM? Uh, times have moved on. Um, so what I did, I sort of stamped my little foot and we said, let's, let's see what we can get away with. And part of that is going back to the basics. This is Thompson Ritchie on presumably something like the machine they, they, they developed Unix on. And if they can do what they did on that, we don't need a distributed system. You know, we're not doing, we're not Google, we're not Facebook, we're not doing that kind of data. So here's the first script. Um, and I'll just sort of walk it through. I mean, some of this will be very obvious, some of it, I don't know if, if, if you're not used to it, but there will be some lessons along the way. So this is very simple stuff. Um, so we have a, CSV file with all the data we do, which we, g we get from outside. And we pipe that through a filter. Uh, is anyone familiar with pipes? Do I have to explain that? Anybody not familiar with pipes? No, let me ref Anybody not familiar with pipes? That's a relief. Good. Um, so we pipe that through a filter, which extracts the general product IDs from this, um, this CSV. That script... I mean, you don't have to worry, uh, it's just not, you know, it looks like printer noise. Um, but basically, all it does is suck out the, uh, the column that says product ID. And there's a couple of utilities that you can pop in there, and that just, that just happens. And then the tails are to remove the headers. That's all it does. And the point about wrapping it up in a little script like that is it gives you a name, and it gives you somewhere to put your comments. All right, so that gives us a sequence of IDs. Uh, next thing to do is figure out, some, some of the journals are irrelevant, uh, not relevant to us, same sort of thing, so here's a little Python script. And the great thing about it is you're in the same world, so when, when things get a little bit complicated, just drop into Python. And in Unix you can make this executable, you don't need the .py on the end, which means when you're at that level, it's just a program. You don't care how it's implemented, it's not, it's not really your problem. And you don't need to define the implementation from the caller. Um, and what this does is, is pull out, push out a stream of relevant product IDs with a not processed flag. And I'll get to that later as to why we did that. And one of the things about doing it this way is it's very easy to test from the command line. You can pump text in and, pump and catch text on the way out. So doing one thing, you can test it. And then finally, a little bit more programming. And this goes, and what the generic info is like the meta, meta information about a, uh, about a journal. Um, take each of those journal identifiers, um, go and get the meta information and stick it on the file system somewhere. Um, and of course, you start this. How do you start doing this? You start by typing in curl and poking at the API, seeing what it does, trying to figure out what you actually need. And that's sort of parts of that will be in the, in, the, in the download thing. So one of the things we did is there's this utility called T which takes a stream on the way in and writes it to the disks while it's at it and then copies it on the way out. And one of the habits we got into was teeing intermediate results so that we could replay, th replay them if we needed to, so we didn't have to keep going back to the service. Um, and again, it's these little tricks that sort of make, make life a bit easier. So you c the other thing is so you can see if something goes wrong, you can see what happened and where, where you got lost. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And so the... the one of the things you get into, one of the habits you get into 
or with this one thing is is thinking about making the stream parsable as it goes through, making giving all the information. So one of the things we did was that um, every line that we passed around, whether a success or failure, included the, the ID, so that we could again we could just file that through a grep and figure out what was happening. So the lessons from this this stage start very small. Um, figure out the options you need for a couple of for the couple of shell commands, and then just wrap it up in a little script um, with a bit of commentary so you don't forget what it means, particularly when the, the options can be a bit obscure sometimes. And then you've got that, that behavior all nicely encased up. One of the th reasons I think people are a bit wary of shell scripts is certainly in the Unix world is they tend to grow and grow and grow and they get sort of enormous and you get, you get lost, which is point two, which is don't get much bigger. Um, I think the hard limit for bash scripts you can actually understand is quite small probably a couple of dozen lines in practice. Um, so, break, you know, we're supposed to refactor these days. Bash scripts are code. Let's refactor, extract components or extract units of behavior into a, uh, into a supporting script. If the behavior gets more complicated, port to a, a, a scripting language that, you that, that makes it a bit easier to work with. Um, inspect the out output. Anybody that works with, with sort of big, biggish data knows that data is full of exceptions that you never would have thought of. Um, so don't take the code for granted. It's very easy just to run this through and then assume it'll work. You have and that's one of the reasons about doing it this way is because you, when you have all these little pieces, you can just compose them together to try something out. And if it's fine, you solidify it, you type it into the script, into an editor. Um, engineering appropriately. So again, people, you know, you might be thinking, oh, we can use persistent queues and this, that, and the other, and it'll be great. Um, actually, in this kind of thing, we're not doing a real-time transactional system. We're not doing this, that, and the other. We're doing a fairly smallish, um, or not too large bit of text analysis. The disk is fine. Um, and it's easy to get um, a little bit carried away into thinking about you need all this, all this special infrastructure when actually it could, it could be almost, almost disposable in some cases. But the trick here is to think in pipes. Think about inputs and outputs and filters that stream together um, that are easy to interact with and compose. And it's that thing about composability, which is actually my, my colleague Nat is, is an, and I have a thing we've been talking about for a long time. Um, I see people that like to put, for example, when they're doing scripting, they like to put um, you know, um, files and stuff in, in t into their scripts. And that just means you end up repeatedly editing it because you, you have to, you know, you, you start to edit a test file or something, work with a test file or something. That's just painful. Keep one thing at a time and separate the source of the data from what you do to it. It's all standard modularity. And then the other part is, is outputting for grep. Again, as you go through, keep the identifiers in every, in, uh, in every line, and then you can see what you've got in your hand. And this sounds all screamingly obvious. I don't see it. I don't know about your, your situation, but I don't see it happening that much, or as much as it ought to. So briefly, stepping through. Um, the next stage was we had to collect a, we collect a list of article identifiers for each journal uh, with, with the paging going on. And it wasn't much more complicated. The first stage is to construct a list of all the journals we found on the file system, by walking the file system. Again, write to a um, tier to a file uh, an intermediate result, so we can do that. Um, so this part point, I was trying to, this is where it starts getting worth doing in parallel, because you're hitting this server in parallel. And I started off by trying to do it in the actual bit of code. And Python isn't great at, at parallelism. And then I sort of bumped into this utility called Parallel, which takes a stream in, forks it out, to a number of, in this case, four threads, or four processes, and then combines the results back in. And there are a number of utilities that do this uh, in the Unix world. Um, and don't forget that the steps within the Unix pipe are parallel. So all these, all these programs run in parallel anyway. So you've got par some parallelism bu built in, if you've got the hardware to it. So you can exploit the hardware that way. And then finally, here's the actual script that does the work, which is to go to the um, it, it takes journal identifiers in, um, goes to the service, downloads the details, and sticks them on the file system. Not very hard. But there are lessons from this. Again, modularity. 
um, don't mix parallelism. Uh, one of the things you see, you know, I've, I spent my time writing multi-threaded code and stuff, and it's very entertaining. It's also very difficult and very brittle. And if you can separate the two things, that makes life a lot easier. Um, and, you know, again, looking for s an existing solution that works, because let the person who's written the parallel utility sort all that out and the, and the, you know, the signal handling or whatever it is they have to do, and we just write a single, single threaded script that does the job, takes stuff in, and puts stuff out on the way. Um, refactor scripts. Again, it's easy to forget that scripts are code as well. And we start, as we went along, we started noticing duplication and refactoring to a small library. And this, for example, this helps, again, a little, little blob of Python. It just helps you to maintain consistency across the, the, across the scripts, particularly with streamed input and output. And then again, keep it simple, keep it very, very focused on the, the raw minimum. Um, so this library was not a big deal. It's 58 lines of Python. Now, that's probably less than the average ma Maven file in itself. And that's the whole thing. Um, and it included the retry code, which we implemented in one place. Um, again, it's all about, uh, all about sort of minimalism and focus. And then the other one, which is, um, again, I don't see as enough as done as much as it should be, is thinking about keeping the scripting name, script names off obvious. Again, it's part of the refactoring. Um, you, you, you start with a script, and then you realize after a while that it's actually turned into something else. And that's the point to rename it. Um, and the particularly as the scripts, number of scripts grows into teens, then it's hard to remember what each one does. Uh, a little bit harder to remember what each one does. So what we did was we started getting conventions. So for example, all the top, there's a bunch of top level scripts that all have the, the format of get x for y. Um, and one of the things to learn that we learned about this is not to put up the, ref the renaming. It's to do it on the spot. As you see it, do it on the spot. I mean, that's the general refactoring problem anyway, a lot of teams. I remem remember in the early days when we started talking about refactoring in, in the XP world. And I go to a site and they say, how much should we refactor? Should we spend 20% time off, you know, 10% refactoring? And the answer is always more than you do now. Because I see very few teams where their biggest problem is a lack of code quality. So, final section is, well, the, nec uh, the next section. Take the journal, we've got a bunch of, uh, take the journal, retrieve the contents of the, the articles. So, the fiddliest bit is converting XML to JSON. So, we, we figure out which articles we need. Once again, we're using, um, uh, we, we store intermediate results, here's the parallel again, and then we pull down <coughs> the XML content, do a bit of cleanup, and persist the content as XML. And that, this, is our largest, this is our largest script, which is not that long. Um, then the last bit is, is to convert that to the, the, the index, that we'll be in the index uh, convert that into a, a, a unified thing for the journal. So walk through all the journals, um, extract the content from each article, and convert it into JSON. And now we started to see common patterns repeated, which probably with a bit more time I should have done. Things like the repeated use of parallel across a, a directory. Again, probably should have put that in a script. Um, the other thing which is this, this, this two stages was to some extent a lack of nerve. This probably should have been piped straight through, but I kind of I was feeling, feeling a bit weak, weak and feeble at that point. And then we just walk through with all the contents and upload it. And the thing with this one is that the bottleneck here is we could have parallelized it, but it doesn't take long to run. And it's all writing to the same platter anyway. So again, it's having a, a, an end-to-end -end view of what's going on, which makes life um, means that you don't have to do stuff that, that's not necessarily useful. And when the dust settles on all of this, this is the top level script that binds everything together. And you'll see that, that you know, if that's our original, at the top, that's our original sort of outline, is that although this is a bit painful to read, it's essentially the same story. You know, but we didn't sort of start saying, oh yes, we must make this look like that. We started one thing at a time. We started with a few curl scripts and a few bits and pieces and refactored and refactored and refactored and got to this. And at each point, there was something we never 
at each point there was something working all the time, something that we could run. And then we sort of gradually um, uh, got there with refactoring. This is actually going faster than I expected. Um, some interesting questions. Would make have been relevant for those of you who used to make? There's a lot of this application, there's a lot of a lot about relationship transformations between files. And make is an much neglected but actually very powerful um, utility. And we, we sort of neglected it at our peril. Um, again, we kind of ran out of time to experiment. But the, we s what we see with a lot of the, the modern build tools is, for example, they have dependencies between targets. So you, know, you have your target here and your dependency, but it's all at the target level. Whereas the great thing about make is it's dependencies between artifacts. And you can actually tell, you know, you can actually depend on things that are on the disk rather than things that are in conceptual things. Um, I think we could have been, we could have even pushed further on the extraction. We could have been more rigorous. Um, some of the code that ended up in the Python library probably could have been stripped out into a, another filter because it was doing, um, it was doing, it, it, you know, it was doing related sort of stuff. Um, but the thing you can't see from the static result is that while we were doing this, there was this whole sort of in interactive environment where we were spending a lot of time with the usual sort of utilities like grep and head, word count and all the rest of it, trying to understand the data, trying to understand the result of each filter, what we were doing, drawing little graphs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's this whole um, interactive experience that we lose when we stay in the IDE or when we stay in, a, in um, when, when we when we think of ourselves as programming rather than writing programs rather than building systems, if you like. In the end, that's the, that was the whole thing. Um, that's the whole payload. Um, it's 19 files, 422 lines. The longest one was, what, 58 lines long. That was, what, that was the library. The shortest one was seven. That's the sort of scale of stuff you can keep in your head um, rather than dropping into frameworks. So I think the, for me, the lessons of this, which again, just keep need, need to keep repeating. Every time I we, we do this do this sort of talk, it's people get reminded, um, is to get out of the IDE. I mean, I love, you know, IDEs are great. I've been through the whole generations from, you know, raw text editors and command line editors all the way up through the beginning of the first refactoring editors and all the rest of it. And they have their place, but they also have not their place. Um, and it, it's too easy to get stuck in there. And, and you know, the first reaction is to, is to start clicking a wizard. Um, there's a lot you can do on the small scale, just growing one, one thing at a time. The other thing is taking a system view, uh, which is actually thinking about what the requirements really are. Uh, with a few exceptions, most of us work on quite large data. We don't work on big data. Um, the, 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 the few exceptions that really do work on big data have you know, serious engineering, and we know who they are, um, but there aren't that many of them. Um, the other thing to remember is that the command line is quite fast. In fact, it's very fast. Most of these utilities were written for much smaller machines and much slower machines, which meant there was no slack. And so when you put them on a modern, modern machine, they go like the wind. Um, I remember years ago, as we were working with them, um, we were trying to talk to a system that accepted a SOAP call, and we wrote this whole Java thing that, you know, use the SOAP thing to generate a Java API and all the rest of it, and we'd fire events at this thing. And we got rather tired of this because we were basically firing the same event, but with a couple of, you know, change of ID or something, and it just seemed to be taking forever. So again, we took a dump of the SOAP of the XML and just wrote a little template scripted up in Python and fired it at the thing. And the first time it ran, it was so fast that we thought it hadn't run. Um, and that's the lesson that keeps coming back, is, is that all this stuff, there are, there are different trade-offs. One of the trade-offs is the, s the cost of startup on, on, on any virtual machine, which may or may not be appropriate or may be worth amortizing. Um, then the, tr the absolutely crucial, this is generic, absolutely based fundamental software structuring development, which is this notion of composability. Little bits and pieces that fit together, each does one thing well, and you have a way of, of binding them together. 
which means you have to think about what the pieces are and how they're going to talk to each other. And it's a classic thing that everybody says, oh yeah, of course we do that. But when you look at the code that most people write, and certainly as I travel from shop to shop, I don't see lots of people doing this. I see lots of people writing long stuff. And in there, buried, is a lot of smaller stuff waiting to get out. Um, and it's, it's the con you know, getting to the point where this is just built into the way you, you function is took me a long time, let's put it that way. You're probably cleverer than me. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, great programmers are, which I'm not, strategically lazy. There's this notion about um, deal with the stuff I have to deal with and not make it more complicated. And again, it's th there's a time in your life when it's good to sort of learn lots of new stuff. That's really important. Um, and then there's another time when you give it all up. Um, and one of, the, one of the, in fact, a colleague of mine, a, a chap I used to work with, said he'd built a development team, which was pretty good. He'd, he'd done a good job. And he had a good, good bunch of the sort of beginner people. They were fine. They were learning used to very enthusiastic. They could remember all, all the buzzwords. And then there's the mid-level people. They, they'd been around a bit. They, they, could, so they could deliver solid, you know, and they really knew their stuff. What he was missing was the, the more experienced people were who were going, I don't know anything anymore. And it's that, that level of, you know, back to basics, if you like, or not, or realizing that, that all that stuff you thought you learned is just, just the beginning that I think is worth, worth cultivating. So strategically lazy, standardized tooling. Just use, this, you can do an awful lot with the tools that come out the box before you install any, anything else. And particularly if you're, wor if you're working in a world where we are, where you have, you know, VMs coming and going and, you know, microservices and all the rest of it. Every little installation is a bit more noise, a bit more weight. Um, and particularly, if you've got lots and lots of servers, um, the collective, each, each one is small, but the collective cost of the whole thing, if you little, add a little bit of weight to each server, collectively, that makes for a lot, that, you know, that's more kit, that's, that's more money, that's more Amazon hours, whatever it is. Um, so it's worth thinking about that. Um, so minimal installation, and then the other part is narrowing the cognitive service surface. So I'm using standard stuff out of the box. This is all I have to know for now. I'm, right, I'm using little tools. That's all I have to know for now. I don't have to learn another framework. I don't have to learn um, another thing. And what's more, when I've gone and someone else has to come in and maintain this, it's whatever it was, 200 lines of code, 400 lines of code, not 30 lines of code and 16,000 frameworks. Um, one of which is broken, or is out of date. Because again, there's no, the, there's, there's no, um, th it this lowers the maintenance load on as well. You don't have to worry about updates. And it's not new. This is the memo, the, f the famous memo from 1964, where Doug McIlroy proposed the idea of coupling pro programs together with, what he said, what was he said, like, like uh, sections of a garden hose. Um, it's been a while. We, you'd think we'd learned this lesson by now. I mean, some of us have, many of us have, um, but we just keep, need to keep remembering it. And you don't have to take my word for it. There's this famous article that popped up a little while ago, um, a sort of social proof, at least an existence proof, that there might be some sense in this. And then, you really don't have to take my word for it, because there's an entire book, which I discovered after I did this work, which is full of hot tips, including some of the utilities that I hadn't known about before, like the uh, CVS cut, CSV cut, and the um, and the there's a there's a couple of the a couple of the utilities for sucking bits out of JSON and XML, and again this notion of interactivity and just play with the data. So that's a bit early. Do you have any? Any thoughts? Does anybody recognize this? Is this familiar concepts? Not the pipes, but the notion of how far you can push it. Yeah, we did the same thing. Mm. It's um, it's one of the things again that it, it's 
I see with some of the, the guys I work with who haven't been through this is, you know, you mentioned some ancient utility, like Orc or something. And they go, oh my God, we go, you know, that's prehistory. We don't do that. Doesn't work. Obviously, doesn't doesn't mean anything anymore. And it's it's um, it, it's we live in an industry with Alzheimer's. I think we forget what we've done before, and then things get rediscovered, which is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't strong enough. Yeah. Again, that th 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 those surprises because if again if you've got you know three or four things, each of which is quite computationally intensive, and, and you've got the cores, then they'll run in parallel. Thank you very much for free. Um, so I'm a data scientist. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And there is one thing I want to point out. When you were saying, you know, it's all the, 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 the young kids will be able to understand yeah. that and that, you know, new models, new machines, and yeah. so forth. Well, all, all that stuff that you demonstrated. Yeah. Um, and, and although they are graphical, like they are all traditionally or originally Unix commands, yeah. I work 100% on Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the, I, I would claim one is it's a rant. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, again, I was just trying to emphasize the concept, and in particular, the interactivity and designing for interactivity and um, for composability. Sure, no, no, I understand. Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't apply. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I was trying to remember. Um, in fact, one of the reasons we started persisting is because it took, naively, it would take sev several hours to, to get the, the journal um, contents out, which was a bit boring. Um, so I think it was, what would it be? I think it was like, The full data set, that, I mean, th all our journals, all our content is, is like 500 gig or something. I think this would be about 10 gig, 10, 20 gig, something like that. Um, but the, for us, the delay was uh, in retrieving them because we were going through an a, a rather slower API. Um, but the, the speed up from, for example, going the parallel download was quite, quite significant <coughs> for us because the delay was all in the you know, in the, in, the, in the web, in the, in the REST API. And again, that's one of the sort of system things, worrying about, w figure out what actually matters or wh where, the, where the delays actually are. Does anybody not believe this? <laughs> it's all nonsense. Or it doesn't apply to them. Okay, I guess it's uh, early coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>